whether they're colored or clear. Glass bottles and jars are green. No trees die to make this eco-friendly packaging. Glass is made of natural ingredients that are abundant. You can recycle glass endlessly, and making it uses less energy than producing metal or plastic. The recipe for glass combines about a half a dozen natural raw materials, but the main ones are silica sand, soda ash, and limestone. Silica sand usually makes up about 45% of the batch. The soda ash helps melt the silica evenly. It comprises about 15%. A limestone content of about 10% makes the finished glass more durable. They combine these ingredients with recycled glass called collet. The factory's equipment feeds precise amounts of the materials into a furnace. Over a full day, the fiery heat, 2,730 degrees Fahrenheit, melts everything together, producing a gooey liquid that's the consistency of honey. The molten glass pours out of the furnace. Shears cut the flow at precise intervals to produce cylindrical gobs. Each gob is the exact amount required to make one bottle or jar. They drop to a device called the scoop. The scoop moves them to troughs that feed them to jar forming and bottle forming machines. A gob of molten glass goes into a preliminary mold. In a matter of seconds, it comes out as what's called a parison, a miniature version of the final bottle. Each parison then moves into a blow mold, the cavity of which is the shape of the final bottle. The equipment blows the compressed air into the parison, stretching the glass outward toward the wall of the mold cavity. This process creates the final bottle shape and hollows out the inside. These are amber-colored beer bottles. The color is produced by adding small amounts of iron, sulfur, and carbon to the glass mix. The factory uses a similar manufacturing process to produce other types of bottles and jars. In this run, the company is making 375 milliliter wine bottles out of clear glass. This run is producing 375 milliliter liquor bottles also out of clear glass. But this mold has a special feature, a recessed insignia on one of the walls, which produces a raised insignia on the front of the bottle. After the bottles leave the forming machine, they travel through flames. Otherwise, they would cool down too quickly and crack from thermal shock. A loader now gently pushes the bottles into what's called an annealing leer. The bottles cool at a controlled rate as they move through the leer. This releases stress from the glass gradually. As the bottles exit the annealing layer, a sprayer coats their exteriors with lubricant. This enables them to move smoothly through the rest of the inspection and packaging line. The bottles now line up in single file to head into the automatic inspection station. As the machine spins each bottle, cameras and probes check for imperfections such as cracks or bubbles. The inspection equipment then examines the top to check dimensions and ensure the threads for the screw cap are molded correctly. Before shipping, a worker does a final visual inspection. The proportion of cullet in glass can be as high as 90%. Cullet melts at a lower temperature, so for every 10% of cullet in the mix, the factory uses up to 2.5% less energy to produce its glass. Now that's an incentive to recycle.
Every time you talk on the phone or go on the internet, what you say or type travels to its destination through fiber optics. Voice and data gets transmitted via pulses of light through hair-thin glass fibers. Those fibers start out as large glass tubes. First, workers unwrap the tubes. Then they submerge them in a corrosive bath of hydrofluoric acid that removes any oil residues. Then they set a tube into each end of a lathe. As the tubes spin, they're heated with a hydrogen-oxygen flame. When the glass turns white, it's getting close to hitting peak temperature. At about 3,500 degrees, the two tubes fuse together. They put this new longer tube onto another lathe. As the tube spins, they inject a mixture of chemical gases inside, while a traversing burner heats everything up. The gas mixture contains liquid forms of silicon, an abundant chemical element found in nature, and germanium, a chemical element similar to tin that's used as a semiconductor in transistors and other electronic devices. As the gases heat, they undergo a chemical reaction that leaves a white soot on the inside of the glass tube. The heat fuses the soot, forming what will eventually become the core of the optical fiber. The glass tube itself will form the fiber's covering. When there's enough fused soot, they turn up the heat until the soot itself turns into glass. Then they heat the glass tube enough to soften it and to soften the new glass inside. The intense heat eventually makes the tube collapse on itself to form a solid rod. The internal structure of the optical fiber has been achieved. But it's in the form of a big bulky rod called a preform. So the next step is to thin it out. First, they excise the preform from the uncollapsed section of the glass tube. Then they install it vertically into the drawing tower, which will draw out the final shape. The drawing tower's oven heats one end of the preform to 3,600 degrees. The glass softens. Gravity helps pull it down, like honey dripping from a spoon. Then, using a glob of glass as a weight, they stretch the soft glass and keep stretching it until they formed a thin glass fiber. A series of pulleys measure the tension on the fiber as it's being drawn. A special monitor makes sure the fiber is precisely the right diameter, just five one thousandths of an inch. Then the fiber passes through UV lamps that bake on an acrylic coating to protect against dust and other contaminants. Finally, the fiber is rolled onto a drum. From here, it's either shipped out as is or put into a cable. Fiber optic cables are expensive to produce, but they're smaller and lighter than traditional copper cables. They carry more information and need fewer repeaters to keep the signal from deteriorating. And unlike copper cables, they're immune to electromagnetic interference. They're also hard to tap without being detected. And all of this is made possible by a complicated process based on a very simple principle, light traveling through glass. There are two types of scrap metal, ferrous and non-ferrous. Ferrous scrap is scrap iron and steel that comes mainly from old cars. 
Non-ferrous scrap metal includes aluminum, copper, lead, and nickel. And the best part is metals can be recycled indefinitely without losing any of their properties. Each year, North American auto plants build millions of cars. Eventually, they end up here, at a scrap metal recycling facility. It takes about two days to process the raw material, mostly old cars and appliances. Crane and bulldozer operators scan the raw material as they gather and stack it. They're looking for anything they can process, propane tanks, glass, or heavy iron that will not shred and that could cause damage to the machinery. An inspector goes into the stockpile to check the material more closely, then signals the crane operator that he can proceed with the next load. The crane's grapple delivers load after load onto a conveyor belt that leads into a shredder. The belt speeds up or slows down according to the weight of the material to feed just the right amount into the shredder. Here's the feed box that contains the shredder laid open. An inspector checks it daily for damage. There's a lot of wear and tear on this machinery. A 4,000 pound drum grabs the material as it comes off the conveyor and forces it into the shredder. Its giant hammers pound away at the cars, mattresses, and other recyclable items, shredding them into fist-sized chunks. An industrial vacuum sucks out bits of rubber or glass mixed in with the shredded steel. The steel pieces stick to these magnetic drums, Anything else falls through to a conveyor belt below. Here, pickers remove any unwanted material caught on the steel pieces, and the clean shredded steel is ready for shipping to customers like steel mills and foundries. The material the magnetic drums don't collect goes on for more processing. There's precious non-ferrous metal, such as copper or brass, mixed in with shredded debris. It all goes into a machine called a trommel, where a rotating drum separates the material by size. Any leftover residue is just trash, but before it goes to a landfill, an inspector checks it to make sure no valuable material has slipped through. The material from the trommel is evenly dispersed onto a conveyor that takes it to a machine called an eddy current separator. Inside, a rotating magnetic drum creates a strong magnetic field that repels non-ferrous metals right up and over a barrier into a storage bin. Any material that doesn't make it over the barrier goes through the separator one more time, just in case there's still some valuable non-ferrous metals mixed in. A conveyor belt carries out the worthless residue to a trash heap. A different conveyor belt carries the non-ferrous metal out of the separator and loads it into a bin for sale. It will go to another plant where they'll separate it by type of metal, mainly copper, brass, and aluminum. After all that shredding, sifting, and separating, here's what's left of the average used car. Take away the rubber, plastic, and upholstery, and you have some shredded steel and some valuable non-ferrous metals. That's a lot of useful material thanks to some efficient recycling. Not so long ago, solar energy was a concept that seemed to be torn from the pages of a science fiction novel. 
But the time has come for this non-polluting energy source to step into the limelight. Or should we say, the sunlight. The future of solar panels is bright. The sun is able to produce electricity. Panels covered with photovoltaic cells convert sunlight into electricity. This blue plate is a module made of crystalline silicon. The grooves are the conductors and the silicon crystals glisten at its surface. To make a solar panel, several modules have to be connected together. Then they apply a soldering flux on each module. The soldering wire is heated with an iron. The modules are placed on a special support. Once the soldering is done, the modules are cleaned by ultrasound in water at 140 degrees. When dried, the perfectly cleaned modules are ready to be assembled. Now they can proceed with soldering the modules by groups. First, a flux is applied, which improves the quality of the soldering. With great dexterity, they assemble four groups composed of nine modules each. In this way, 36 modules are soldered and connected in series. Modules are assembled end to end. They have to be handled with great care. Using a voltmeter, the voltage of each module is verified. At this stage, it's easy to remake a solder connection if there's a problem. If the voltage is adequate, they use suction grips to make handling of the nine rows of modules easier and to keep them clean. The modules are placed into position. Then this metallic strip is inserted. It is a conductor that will link the four groups of nine modules. Solder connections are made to link the modules to the metallic strip. Then they put on this transparent sheet of layered glass. It serves as a rigid transparent form which will support the modules. The superposing of parts forms a laminate that increases the rigidity and solidity of the panel. Finally, a sealing film is applied to protect the module. To laminate and stiffen the solar panel, it's placed in a heated oven from which air has been vacuumed out. The panel will cook at 176 degrees for 15 minutes. The oven hermetically reseals to proceed with the vacuuming out of air. And here's the finished panel. All the components are bonded together. They now proceed with a test. The panel is placed in a solar simulator. Negative and positive contacts of the solar panel are connected to a voltmeter. The panel is inserted into the simulator and a powerful lamp will illuminate it. The voltmeter is read to make sure that panels supply the electric current required. Here now is the assembly of another kind of solar panel called the amorphous silicon type. Its components were made in Europe and Asia. These are the positive and negative connecting wires of the solar panel. The panel is placed into a plastic frame and glued in place. Then the frame is screwed tight so that it won't move. The solar panel made up of crystalline silicon modules is put onto an ABS plastic frame. It is now finished. Fabricating this panel will have required about one hour of work. Six of them are made here every day. Bet you thought the only way to grow lettuce was in a garden. Well, vegetables don't necessarily need soil. They can also grow in water, provided it contains the proper nutrients and fertilizers. That's called hydroponics.
This method of growing hydroponic lettuce is called deep pool floating raft technology. It sounds pretty complicated, but it's really quite simple. And it all starts in the germination area with lettuce seeds. To plant them, workers use a steel tray connected to a vacuum hose. The tray has 276 holes, and the vacuum sucks a seed into each one. Next, they take a foam block with corresponding holes called an oasis and position it onto the tray. A quick flip deposits a seed into each hole of the oasis. The seeds are coated in clay. Clay holds in moisture to nourish the seed, but also breaks apart easily to let the seed sprout. On the way to the greenhouse, the seeds get their first watering. Then workers set them afloat. The pool of water is about 12 inches deep. Technicians continuously monitor and manipulate its levels of oxygen and fertilizer. That's the key to hydroponic growing. The water is never discarded, just topped off, to replace what the plants drink and what evaporates. On the first day, they water the seeds frequently. Within a couple of days, the seedlings start to appear. They water and fertilize them. By about the fourth day, there's some significant sprouting action. Again, they water and fertilize the plants. The first leaves emerge on about the seventh day in the summer and about the 11th day in the winter. The winter growth rate is slower because there's less sun. At this point, it's time for the first in a series of transplants. Workers transfer the lettuces from the 276 plant oasis to a styrofoam board that holds more plants, 288. They set the boards afloat in the nursery zone. At about the 13-day mark in the summer, the 20-day mark in the winter, transplant number two takes place this time to a less crowded styrofoam board that holds just 72 plants. This gives the plants more light and more room to grow. Workers use a hook to avoid damaging the roots. A plant needs healthy roots to absorb water and nutrients. The last transplant happens on about the 26th day in the summer, the 45th day in the winter. Now the lettuces go from the 72 plant board to a board that holds just 18. By now the plants have long roots, so they're harder to manipulate. The lettuces go into the production zone, the last move before harvesting. These pools are bigger, so automatic machines move the boards around. This hydroponic system produces 500 plants per square yard, almost five times the yield of field-grown lettuce. And it's safer too. There's no need here for pesticides or fungicides. And because it's all indoors, fertilizers can contaminate the environment. By about the 45th day in the summer, the 75th day in the winter, the lettuces are finally ready for harvesting. Workers cut off the yellowed leaves at the base, then either cut off the roots or wrap them around the stem, depending on how this crop will be sold. Then they vacuum cool each lettuce for longer shelf life. Insulation keeps your home warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. One type of insulation material is cellulose fiber made from recycled paper. It's derived from a natural source, wood fiber, so it's non-polluting. It contains no asbestos, no fiberglass, and there's no formaldehyde in it, so it doesn't emit any gases. 
Like other insulation materials, cellulose fiber has to meet strict government safety standards. One fire safety test assesses what's called smolder resistance. The company lab weighs a sample from the production line, then inserts a lit cigarette in it. Once the cigarette burns out, which takes an hour or two, the lab weighs the sample again. The weight loss must be less than 15%. How they make cellulose insulation isn't very complicated. It all begins with recycled paper, delivered in bulk. Workers load it onto a conveyor belt, and from that point on, the entire process is automated. The paper first goes into a machine called the primary mixer. It separates the bunched up pieces, preparing them for shredding. The machine's powerful magnet removes staples, paper clips, and any other pieces of metal. From there, the paper goes into a shredder, which rips it into pieces about two inches long. The factory mixes the shredded paper with boric acid, a natural compound that acts as a fire retardant. It also makes the insulation pest resistant, and it helps fend off mold, wood decay, and corrosion. Now a machine called a fiberizer shreds the paper into tiny pieces, only about an eighth of an inch long, and it mixes them with more boric acid. From the time the recycled paper arrives by truck to the time it comes off the line as cellulose fiber insulation, only about five minutes have passed. But the insulation doesn't leave the factory before undergoing thorough safety testing. This test assesses what's called open flammability. They heat the insulation to 122 degrees Fahrenheit to represent the temperature of a roof in the hot sun. Then they ignite it. The flame travels, but then dies out, thanks to the boric acid. If that happens within a certain distance, the insulation is safe. Outside research firms also test the product for safety to independently corroborate the results of the company's tests. The automated packaging equipment blows 25 pounds of insulation into a bag, at the same time compressing the fiber into a block. Some types of thermal insulation come as thick, rectangular blankets known as bats. You install them by hand, fitting them snugly between the wall studs. Cellulose fiber doesn't come in bats. It's known as loose fill insulation. A professional installer has to inject it in between the walls. By spraying it under pressure, it fills all the spaces without any gaps, something that's hard to do with pre-shaped bats. Insulating performance is referred to as R-value. The higher the R-value, the more effective the insulation. Cellulose fiber insulation has a higher R-value than loose fill mineral fiber insulation and depending on which statistics you're looking at, has either the same R-value as loose fill fiberglass or a higher R-value than fiberglass. Cellulose fiber is denser than other materials, so it better resists air movement, making it less likely to move out of place after installation.